Hi, everyone. There's a wave of disinformation going around the internet right now about a fake rapture. And I just want to show really quick that the escape by flight is a solid part of Bible prophecy. It occurs after a 1260-year tribulation and before a final three-and-a-half-year time of trouble. But the Bible does not say anything about a false rapture. So first, the word rapture is not actually in the Bible. The word rapture was used in a few medieval translations of the Bible, but we now know they mistranslated a lot of the biblical writings. Jeremiah even said they were mistranslating over 2,500 years ago. That's why the true message in the Bible was written in code. So while some people are arguing that one of the definitions of the word rapture is rape, that is true but it has nothing to do with the biblical escape because the word rapture is not used at all in the original biblical languages. A few of the medieval translations of the Bible used the word rapture or raptura as a translation of the Greek word harpazo, which means to seize, carry off by force, to snatch out or away, catch up or catch away. The word harpazo was used 13 times in the Bible, Matthew 11.12 uses the word harpazo when it says, and the violent take it by force. Matthew 13.19 uses the word harpazo to say, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. John 6.15 uses the word harpazo when it talks about Jesus being taken by force. John 10.12 uses the word when it describes the wolf catching the sheep. John 10, 28 and 29 uses the word harpazo when it says no man will be able to pluck the sheep out of the Father's hand. Acts 8, 39 uses the word to describe the Spirit of the Lord catching away Philip. Acts 23, 10 uses the word to describe Paul being taken by force. Paul uses the word harpazo to describe being caught up to heaven in 2 Corinthians 12 and 1 Thessalonians 4. In Jude, the word harpazo is used to describe being pulled out of the fire. And in the book of Revelation, the word is used in chapter 12 when it says the child was caught up to God. So as you can see, the word harpazo is sometimes used to convey a negative event in the Bible. However, the word harpazo is not the predominant word used in reference to the rescue. A lot of people think the escape of the bride in the Bible is the harpazo, but that's not correct. The bride is the woman in Revelation 12, and in both verses 6 and 14, where the woman's escape is mentioned, the word harpazo is not used. In verse 6, when it says, and the woman fled into the wilderness, it uses the Greek word fugo, which means to flee away, seek safety by flight, to flee something abhorrent, to be saved by flight, to escape safely out of danger, to flee away, vanish, or escape. Nowhere does this refer to something negative. It's a positive thing. It's not a stealing or kidnapping. It's not the word rapture. It is an escape away from danger. In verse 14 of Revelation 12, when it says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, it uses the word pitomai, which simply means to fly, fly, or flying. In addition, Revelation 12 is a timeline. It gives us slightly different details to the timeline Jesus gave us. So the fleeing, it indicates, occurred after the abomination of desolation, and the flying occurs after the tribulation of 1260 years. In Matthew 24, the flying is referred to as the gathering of the elect, and this also does not use the word harpazo. It uses the word episinago, which means to gather together. Jesus says, when this happens, all the tribes of the earth will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And Luke 17 tells us, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, one will be taken and the other left. Also, in this case, the word translated as taken is the Greek word paralambano, which means to take with oneself an associate or a companion, to accept, to receive something, take up or take away. So again, this is not the word harpazo or rapture. It does not refer to a negative event. It is not an abduction. It clearly means to take a companion or associate, an acceptance, not an abduction. So when it says in Luke 17 that one will be taken and one will be left, the one that is taken is the companion or associate, not the enemy.
One reason some people believe there's going to be a fake rapture is they misunderstand the parable in Matthew 13. In the parable of the wheat and tares, Jesus said, In the time of harvest, gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So at first glance, it might seem to indicate that the tares will be removed first. However, it does not say that. It says they will be bound to be burned. So there are two things that Jesus says will happen to the tares. First, they will be bound, and second, they will be burned. There's only one thing happening to the wheat in this verse. The wheat will be gathered into Jesus' barn. And that is a reference to both Matthew 24 and Luke 17. The elect will be gathered by the angels and taken. In the parable of the wheat and tares, Jesus uses the word barn to refer to the safe place where the elect will be taken, which Matthew 24 confirms is in heaven. It's off planet. Luke 17 also confirms that when Jesus said they will be taken to where the body is. The word translated as body in Luke 17 is soma, which also means bodies of planets and stars. Revelation 21 tells us the bride will come down out of heaven at the end. That is because it tells us in Revelation 11 and 12 and Luke 17 that the bride will be taken to heaven and remain there for three and a half years during the final time of trouble. The final time of trouble occurs after the burning stone, after the tribulation of 1260 years. The timeline is very clear about that because it gives us details about the events that are happening during that time. So we have to understand the timeline Jesus laid out for us that he said we could find in the book of Daniel. It's not a simple timeline. It is complex, but it is necessary to understand that timeline before we can understand the riddle of the wheat and tares. Jesus said himself, before he told them the riddle of the wheat and tares, that there are some who will see and hear the riddles but not understand them. It's necessary to understand the timeline Jesus gave us first. Then once we solve the timeline, we can see where the other variables fit. He said, at the time of harvest, the tares will be bound together first in order to be burned, and the wheat will be gathered into the barn. We know the wheat will be taken to heaven at the time of harvest. We're told that again and again. So the barn represents New Jerusalem, the throne in heaven, the Father's house. But it says the tares will be bound together. It doesn't say they will be taken. It says they will be gathered and bound together. They're bound in order to be burned. And that burning is a clue about where they are going to be bound because we're told everywhere, including in Second Peter, that the burning will occur on the earth. It's Babylon that will be burned. So if the tares are going to be burned and Babylon is the place where the burning occurs, then that means the tares will be bound in Babylon. They will be gathered together and bound in bundles first in Babylon. So it's absolutely necessary to understand what Babylon is in order to understand where the tares will be bound together. The tares will not be taken off planet. They will be bound in bundles to be burned and the burning will occur in Babylon on the earth. It says this will occur in the time of harvest, which Jeremiah tells us is when Babylon will fall in the time of harvest. So the tares will be bound together in Babylon. Then the wheat will be gathered into the barn, which is off planet in the father's house. Here's the other thing. There's no mention of a false escape. Jesus does not say anything about a false gathering of the elect or a false taking away or a false flying to safety or a false gathering into the barn or a false father's house. And again, this escape that the Bible says will occur at the end of the 1260 year tribulation and at the start of the final time of trouble when the meteorite hits, it is a positive event a rescue from danger, an acceptance of friends, a gathering by the angels. So people that recognize that the church rapture doctrine is false, they're absolutely right. But please don't throw out the most important parts of the prophecy just because the church got it wrong. 
That escape is a solid part of the prophecy that Jesus gave us, an extremely important part of the prophecy. And unfortunately, many people who are believing the false teaching about a fake rapture don't realize that that is actually one of the teachings of the beast. And the Bible itself tells us that. It says, after the escape, during the final time of trouble, the beast will blaspheme those in heaven and the name of God. It doesn't say how exactly they will do that, but one of the possibilities is that they're going to say it was a fake rapture or that those who were saved were abducted by aliens. Because Hollywood is already pushing that concept. In 2015, there was another television series that came out called The Whispers, which is all about an evil alien entity who is a murderer and a liar who, in the season finale, abducts certain children off the planet in an event that resembles a rapture. And that is a lie from the beast, and the Bible makes that clear. The beast is a liar and a deceiver, and all sorts of people all over the world are worshiping the beast right now. The deception at its very root, we're told, is that the beast presents itself as God, and during the final time of trouble, the beast will blaspheme the true God and the people in heaven that God rescues. And we already see that happening now. The beast's followers are already prepping the public to believe the beast's lie that there is a fake rapture coming and that those who are going to be saved are somehow bad. And that's what they're going to believe because Jesus said there are going to be Christians and Jews and other prominent religious figures that are not going. So of course they're going to tell you that the bad people were taken and the good people left. If the leaders of the church are left behind, then of course they're going to tell you that the people that were taken were bad and that they're the good people and they were left behind, therefore it wasn't a real rapture. But the Bible prophecy is clear that that is going to be a lie. There is no fake rapture event mentioned in the Bible at all. If that was going to happen, that is a major event. It would be in the prophecy. There is a very real rescue that we are told will occur when the meteorite hits at the end of 1260 years and at the start of the final three and a half years of trouble. And we are told that the people left behind are the queen. They think they are not a widow. What does that mean? It means they think they're the bride of Christ. And we've already looked at this. They're worshiping the beast. Revelation 13. They are the two false witnesses. The wolves are among the sheep right now. Jesus said that. They are among the sheep. So some of the people in the churches are bride and some of them are the wolves. Some of them are the queen. So the Bible prophecy is very clear that the ones who think they have it hands down are not the ones that are going to go. So they are going to believe that lie. They're going to push that lie. And they're already pushing that lie now. It just is amazing to me. They're already pushing the lie before it, it, it hasn't even happened yet. It's not biblical. There is no fake rescue mentioned in the Bible. If the rescue happens, it's the real thing. So we should be praying to be accounted worthy to go because it's the queen who assumes that she's not a widow, that she's married to Christ. We should be praying to be accounted worthy, not assuming that we are worthy. Okay, so there's one final thing that I wanted to mention. Some people will try to say there's no escape or rescue in Bible prophecy at all, which is totally false. They obviously are ignoring key parts of the prophecy. But I want to quickly go over another scripture that they try to use as support for their non-escape theory, and that is John 17, 15. In the King James translation, Jesus says, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. First, the phrase take them out of can also be translated raise them up by. The word translated as take is the Greek word arrow, which means to raise up. And the word translated as out of is the Greek word ek, which also means by. Second, notice the word thou is not in the original text. So Jesus was saying in John seventeen fifteen, I pray not that they be raised up by the world, but that they be kept from the evil. That is what the original language says. The correct translation, just as it says in the original language, is that he prays they will not be raised up by the world. 
which makes perfect sense. He's implying here that if they're raised up by the world, they would be subjected to the evil. And we're told over and over that the Satanists rule the world right now, that the beast sits in a palace, that they put what is good for evil and what is evil for good. The Satanists sit in the highest places in this world. The beast doesn't live in some shack in the middle of nowhere. The beast lives in a lavish palace. That's what the Bible says. The evil is at the top of this world. So it makes sense that Jesus says he prays, you will not be raised up by this world, but instead will be kept from the evil. And the evil is at the top of the world. In other words, it's good if you're not succeeding or rising to the top because that's where the evil is. He doesn't say you are evil if you rise up. He says he prays you won't rise up because he doesn't want you to experience the evil that's at the top. So he is absolutely not saying that he prays they won't be rescued because he says over and over again, they will be rescued. For example, in John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. He says he is going to prepare a place for you in his father's house. So that's, that's not somewhere on the earth. That's the father's house. It's off planet. That is the figurative barn where the wheat will be gathered together, where the elect will be taken by the angels where the woman will fly to for three and a half years, and where New Jerusalem will descend back down to earth from heaven as a bride after that final time of trouble. So the rescue in Bible prophecy is very real, but the Bible does not speak of a fake rapture because there is no fake rapture. What people are calling a fake rapture is actually the blasphemy of the beast against God and against those who will be rescued by God during the final time of trouble. That's in Revelation 13. And they're actually preparing people for that blasphemy now. The prophecy says they will actually make war against God during that final three and a half years. The kings of the earth will gather together in a place called Armageddon after the meteorite hits to fight against God, but they will fail. The deception is already in effect now. It's been working for centuries. Many Christians, Jews, and Muslims are worshiping the beast and the little horn now. So if you're still here after the meteorite hits, just remember that no matter what lies they tell you, the Elohim look like us, they're good, and they don't want or even need to dominate us. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that. Anyone who says anything different is a liar. So for more information, watch the playlist Bible's Countdown to the Meteorite and Rescue, linked here and in the description below. I just want to say thank you to those who make this work possible. I hope you're doing well, and I'll talk to you next week.